Good evening. Thank you for coming this evening and for being so patient in the process of getting you into what is an extremely popular event. I'm going to ask you to please make sure that you've turned off your cell phones before we get started. And also ask you to be patient again, as some people may come in a little bit late and cause a bit of a disruption as they move into the seats, which are always in the middle and always mean that they have to <laughs> climb over you. <laughs> so there it is. Uh, my name is Patsy Hicks, and I'm Director of Education here at the Museum of Art. And on behalf of the museum, I want to welcome you to what will be, I know, not just a reading, but a performance. <laughs> and I have the delightful task of introducing our speaker, author, reader, I should say in parallel, but you all know who he is. Author of 30 books of fiction, his work has been translated into more than two dozen languages, has appeared in most major American magazines, including frequently in The New Yorker, where he has even inspired some of the drawings or cartoons, and has won numerous literary awards. This evening, returning to the museum in what has become a much anticipated and highly animated annual event, T.C. Boyle, Santa Barbara's prolific and perennial favorite, reads from his latest novel, Blue Skies. Called by fellow author Annie Prue, brilliantly imaginative in a terrifying way, Blue Skies follows in the tradition of Boyle's finest novels, combining high octane plotting with mordant wit and shrewd, some would say prescient, social commentary. Described as an eco-thriller with teeth, this tragicomic novel captures the absurdity and inexpressible sadness at the heart of everything. Joining him on stage, you see our two stands here, after a scene-stealing performance last year, how many of you were here last year when he read from his short stories, is his daughter and an actress in her own power and right, Carrie. So please join me in welcoming them both to our stage. Oh, hello, folks. That was the best part of it. Thank you. Uh, this is a special evening for me, and I'm not just shining you on. I have been running around the world with this book since May, and this is the final gig right here at home. And it's a special because, as with last time, I have Carrie to read with me. Um, I'll give you a brief setup, and we'll launch right into it. So this book is a companion piece to 2000's A Friend of the Earth. Back then, I set that novel in the Santinas Valley and up in the Sierra Nevada. And I projected to 2026, from the year 2000. And yes, I was prescient, sadly so. We had fires, floods, and even a pandemic in that book. Uh, recently, though, uh, what I imagined in my wise guy way would happen 2050 when I'd be dead, you know. It's here. We're living with global warming now. Uh, it's front page news every day, everywhere in the world. It's inescapable. And so I've written a new book, Blue Skies, in order to kind of assess what it's like for all of us to live daily with this new reality we have to face. You know, it's bad enough having to sit in traffic and go to the dentist, but, <laughs> you know, now we have the floods, the fires, the storms, etc. Um, there are uh, three chief characters in this, and it has two locations. One is Santa Barbara, and one is coastal Florida. The heroine is named Kat, and you'll be introduced to her tonight. We will both read in her voice, but I think it's great that Carrie's here so you can hear a female voice for her part. That's all you need to know. <laughs> they were like jewelry, living jewelry. And she could see herself wearing one wrapped around her shoulders to Bobo's or the Cornerstone and sitting at a sidewalk cafe. 
while people strolled by and pretended not to notice. It would make a statement, that was for sure. She put on a tube top so you could see the contrast it made with her bare skin, black, definitely black. And she'd wear her black jeans too, and maybe her fedora. And she just looked down at her drink, or up at Todd, as if nothing were out of the ordinary. And he'd go along with it too, she was sure of it. They were in that phase of their relationship where he'd given her a ring, and uh, they'd moved in together and she could have just about anything she wanted. Well, except for a baby. Are you joking or what? I'm no way even close to being ready for that. And plus the expense, Jesus. He wouldn't let her have a dog either, or a cat. He was allergic. Hair, dander, fleas. And did she have any idea of what his parents had to spend on inhalers and injections and the rest of it when, she, when he was a kid? She didn't. And at that point, she didn't care. Talk about impulse buying. The minute she walked through the door and saw them glittering there in their plexiglass cases, Oh, she knew she had to have one. The shop was called Herps, and it was located on the fringe of the shopping district where the fast food places were and the auto supply and a couple of hole-in-the-wall Haitian and Cuban restaurants. She wouldn't even have noticed it, let alone push through the door if she hadn't been so bored. Todd was having the car detailed. And he couldn't just leave it there and trust them to do their job. No, he had to look over their shoulders while they applied their rags and toothbrushes and sealants, making sure they were on top of it. And that was just the way he was, a perfectionist. And he liked to say the two of them were a good match because she was an imperfectionist. Which might have been passive aggressive, but it really wasn't that far from the truth. So opposites attract. Wasn't that the way of biology? She'd been looking for a bar, thinking a mojito would brighten her afternoon when she saw the snake there in the window, thick as a truck tire and stretched out on an artificial branch canted up off the floor at a 45 degree angle. It was chocolate colored, with gold latticework that ran the length of it like a pattern in a catalog. Its eyes were hard, cold beads. Its tongue flicked in and out. Most of all, it was present in a way most things in this world definitely weren't. She stared at it for a long moment, falling into a kind of trance till the reflection of a car wheeling by on the street behind her brought her out of it. Of course, she'd seen snakes before. At the zoo, in nature films on TV, smeared across the blacktop on one country road or another, but she'd never really looked at one. Not until now. When the abstraction and the actual fused into an idea, a want, a need, a sudden need so pressing it constricted her throat. She paused a moment to dig the water bottle out of her purse and take a long, lukewarm swallow before she swung round and stepped inside. The place was dimly lit all the light radiating from the individual display cases. The cases lined the walls and stood end to end on low tables in the middle of the room, some with lizards or frogs or turtles, but most with snakes, which lay there, motionless like so many bolts of material in a fabric shop. There was a smell too, subtle and dry, a smell of process. And she thought about that, the snakes unhinging their jaws to take in their prey. Mice or rats, wasn't it? Or rabbits, for the big ones. And then what? Shitting, she supposed. Snake shit. And what was that like? Was that what she was smelling? They must have pissed too, though she'd read somewhere they reabsorbed most of their moisture. Or maybe Cooper had told her. Her brother, the biologist, who knew everything. The snakes barely stirred. But for the one, right in front of her, nosing in slow motion at the clear plastic lid of its container, so calm and unhurried, it could have been narcotized. It was a snake in a box, and it had nowhere to go. The box was everything. The box was the world, which somehow struck her as sad. Shouldn't they have more room? A terrarium where they could stretch out to their full length with rocks and dirt, or at least stand. At least sand. Didn't snakes like sand? Or is that only desert snakes? The term sidewinder came to her head along with a quick flash of an image from a nature show, a dun snake looping across a barren landscape, the engine of its own intention. But this one, the one before her, was beautiful. They all were, as if somebody had dipped a brush in acrylics and traced the lines that radiated in a widening V from their mouths to draw reticulate patterns across their backs and down their sides. She was drifting from case to case, peering inside, shopping. When a guy there, when a guy was there, suddenly appearing from a door and back she hadn't noticed. And she realized 
He must have been watching her on closed circuit TV, maybe from one of those ergonomic office chairs you could push all the way back till you were practically levitating, because there was no reason for him to be on his feet in a deserted store in the middle of the day. You looking for anything in particular? He leaned a hip casually against the waist-high table, supporting several of the cases in the aisle, his face lit from below like a Halloween trick, the brightness sharpening the tip of his nose. He was about her age, or maybe a year or two older, and he wasn't chunky or fat, but just undefined in the way of a whole generation of guys who played video games compulsively through all the hours of every day of the week, of which Todd, thankfully, wasn't one. I don't know, she said. Tell me about them. I mean, they're gorgeous. Are these the prices here, these numbers on the side? Oh yeah, sure, but if you see something you really like, I'm always willing to bargain. I breed them, you know? Uh, That's my thing in life. (laughs) This one, for instance, she said, leaning leaning over the case nearest her, where a milky pale snake, maybe two feet long and decorated with neatly defined bars the color of lemon peel, lay inert on its belly, looking at nothing. What's his story? That's a banana coral glow, a ball python morph. He swept his hand in the air. All these right here, they're all balls. I just got back from Repticon over in Kissimmee, the big expo. Mmm, she nodded, though she had no idea what he was talking about. He was trying to sell her something, and she was going to buy it. These were the preliminaries. Part of the price was listening to him talk. And I just laid them out, even my rarer hybrids, in case somebody stopped by. The really primo ones go back over to my house when I close up at seven. But I am in business, and most of what you see is for sale. It's pretty, she said, then motioned to another. This one, the color of dried blood with a black imbricate design like something you'd see in a print top at Anthropology. This one, too. But the one that really caught my eye is the one in the window, which is too big, I know, but do you have anything like that? I mean, that pattern. You know, of maybe this size. Well, yeah, a couple, but most people want balls. They're the fad right now. She followed him across the room to another table, where there were four cases containing snakes, just like the one in the window, only smaller. Much smaller, a tenth of the size, a twentieth even. They were somehow cute, if you could describe a snake as cute. Self-contained, sleek, vibrant. She couldn't find the adjective, except that this size, they were proportional, just right. Neat, her mother would say. Are they babies? More or less. These are Burmese, Burmese pythons. They banned them for a while a couple years back because of the problem down in the Everglades. Hmm, they got loose, right? Didn't I hear about that? People can be totally irresponsible. Let's face it, just look at the thousands of dogs and cats that have to get put down in the shelters every year. But we got that overturned. Owning a snake is a basic constitutional guarantee. Life, liberty, happiness, right? And nothing's gonna make you happier than having a snake in your life. And while the annuls and the bearded dragons and all that, they're fine on their own, you know, for kids especially, a snake's the real deal. You'll see. He paused. He had a handkerchief knotted round his neck to soak up the sweat, she supposed. It was hot outside, hotter in here. He took a minute to unknot the kerchief, slap it against his thigh two or three times, as if that would do any good, then stuff it in his pocket. First time, right? (laughs) Is it that obvious? No, no, it's exciting, he said. It's like, welcome to the club. And I love the Burmese, don't get me wrong. They make great pets, but they do tend to get big. (laughs) He was gazing steadily at her now, delivering his pitch, and she wondered if her face was flattened by the lights the way his was, which of course it must have been, which only added to the sense of intimacy, of initiation, because this was cool. It was so cool. A whole new world opening up to her on a day that was otherwise as ordinary as the two poached eggs on wheat toast she'd ordered at the diner before they brought the car in. Well, so what's the difference? If I take one of these four here, they're all the same, right? I mean, is one healthier than another or different to your eye? Which one would you pick? Your choice. They're all from the same mother. It took her a moment. You mean the one in the window? As I say, they get big. You keep it for its lifespan and you're gonna want to, I promise you, because it's a trip. And you're really gonna get attached to it, but say that's 20 years or even 25 at the outer limit. This little guy here, he tapped the near case with a forefinger, could wind up 19, 20 feet long, though they average out at something like 12 or 13. He paused, gave her a steady look. 
For some reason, an image of the, that mojito she'd been looking for appeared, dead center in her mind, frosted and festive. She could feel the sweat on her scalp. Her throat was dry. Her shorts clung to her as if she were dancing, a slow dance with an invisible partner. The balls are smaller, he said, which truthfully is why they're more popular right now. That and the really cool morphs people have been creating. Todd was gonna be surprised. Todd was gonna smile and say, cool. But underneath it, he was going to resist. Or, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe he'd get into it with her. Maybe she'd buy him one too. He'd wear it along with her when they went out, just to show off a little and why not? Why not be different for a change? There's more to life than work and take out for dinner and Netflix and sitting out on the deck watching the tide carry the beach away as if they were already 100 years old. But she was getting ahead of herself. And really, Todd didn't need the attention. He got that at work. She tapped the case in front of her. And that's the price there, in Magic Marker. 350? The snake seemed to glance up at her then, though its eyes were so opaque, she couldn't really tell. Yeah, and these are a real bargain compared to the balls. You're willing to go down though, right? Make it an even three, he said. It was probably hotter inside than out, but at least it was out of the sun. The minute she went through the door, riding the high of her new purchase, the sun started building invisible walls all around her. This was fall, hurricane season. And though she loved it, loved Florida, loved Todd, she missed California on days like this when you're instantaneously converted into a sweat machine and the air was so heavy it was like walking neck deep through a river that kept fanning out in front of you as far as you could see. Her legs went dense on her. Her tee was glued to her back and her bra straps were like wet rawhide. Mojito, she murmured, repeating it under her breath. Mojito, 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 as if she were playing a game. And she began to laugh at herself as cars punched through the wall of light one after the other. The windows rolled up, air conditioners cranked. But wait, was that a bar across the street? It was. A place called Cora's, neon sign, double door with awning windows flanking it. No tables outside, just an expanse of blotched and spat over sidewalk. A parrot screamed from one of the battered looking palms that limped down both sides of the street. And here was a jetliner. Fat as a blimp, just hanging there in the sky on its descent into the airport. She didn't like going into strange bars alone, guys hitting on her, old men too, or just the way they looked at her. But this was an emergency, wasn't it? And a celebration. She'd have a drink, then call Todd and tell him she had a surprise for him. <laughs> and if he wasn't done yet and the place was tolerable, really all that mattered right now was air conditioning. Maybe she'd have another. The snake was in a cloth bag imprinted with the name of the store, just like any other purchase, except, of course, that you couldn't put it in a plastic bag because it wouldn't be able to breathe, as the guy who'd sold it to her, RJ, had explained. No, it should have been obvious. He sold her a tank for it, too, 100 gallons, which seemed too big until she thought of the mother in the window. And she'd taken three bags of aspen and coconut fiber bedding, as well as a dozen frozen mice for food. Fuzzies, the next stage up from pinkies, which were newborns without fur, another thing she just learned today. All of which she and Todd would pick up on the way home. That was fine, and she was already thinking about where she'd set the tank up. In the living room next to the TV where everybody could see it? Or maybe in the bedroom where it would be the first thing she'd see when she opened her eyes in the morning. Aside from Todd, that is. But Todd didn't glisten or writhe except when they were having sex. And then she was laughing again because the snake's name had suddenly come to her. She'd call him Willie. And if people asked her about it, and they would, she'd just widen her eyes and say, it's a private joke. <laughs> RJ had offered to hold the snake for her till she came back, but she'd shaken her head no. She wanted the thrill of carrying it with her like any other new purchase. And though it couldn't have weighed more than a can of tomato paste, she was enjoying the solidity of it there and the bag dangling from her right wrist as she debated whether to cross the street there or trudge all the way up to the light. But Jesus, it was hot. Which must have been nice for Willie, but it was killing her. She shot a glance both ways, timing the traffic, then crossed the street in a quick skipping stride, pulled open the door of the bar and ducked inside. She liked the place right away because it was deserted but for the bartender, a woman middle-aged with gold ear coral earrings and a generic Northern European face, not much different from her mother's actually, who would turn out to be none other than Cora herself. And a couple, also middle-aged, sharing a plate of taquitos at the bar. All three of them gave her a nod of greeting as if she'd been coming here at two in the afternoon every day for the past six years. 
which made her feel she'd lucked out. She made her way up to the bar and took a seat two stools down from the couple, giving them their space, and waited for the bartender to ask the question to which she'd had the answer for the better part of the past hour now. <laughs> the, mood, the music was unobtrusive, jazz of some sort, the air conditioning set so low it was practically arctic, and all the usual bottles lined up on a tier of shelves behind the bar, including, she saw right away, the Flor de Caña white rum that was the only rum on the planet, as far as she was concerned, for mojitos anyway. She gulped half her drink down before she realized what she was doing. She was that thirsty. Then asked for another and a glass of ice water and took out her phone to call Todd. Hey, he said, picking up on the first ring. You done yet? I don't know, Cat. Another half hour, maybe? You okay? Where are you? A bar. A bar? Isn't it a little early in the day? I've got a surprise for you. Really? Like one of those surprises where you saved $100 because the dress you bought was on sale? That kind of surprise? <laughs> no, it's something for both of us. She could hear noises in the background, the usual thumping and banging, men's voices, oldies rock hollowly echoing off the walls. And she thought he was going to say something more, make another snide comment, or at least ask what it was. But he didn't. So she just said, call me when you're done. She took her time with the second drink, playing with her phone and idly fishing through the nuts in the smudged glass dish on the bar in front of her. There was soccer, game, on TV. Not that it meant anything to her, it was just there, always there. In every bar, imprinting images on your brain throughout every minute of the day and night. They played soccer at night too, at least somewhere in the world. And of course, there were rebroadcasts for the convenience of those who missed out on the excitement the first time around. 22 guys in shorts, eternally kicking a ball around a field of green as creme de menthe, a drink she hated. How could anybody ever drink that, or chartreuse, or Pernod, or even worse, drink it and watch soccer? She took the purse over the back of the stool, but she kept the cloth bag in her lap, where she could feel the weight of it and communicate a little body heat to the snake, to Willie, in case the air conditioning was too much for him. But then she didn't know what constituted too much since all this was new to her. The thought made her impatient. She wanted to get home, see him, admire him, play with him, or at least handle him to establish trust, which was the first step, reinforced by food. Snakes couldn't love you the way dogs or cats could. Their brains were too primitive to foster any higher emotions. But RJ had assured her that it would definitely recognize her and it come to regard her, if not with love, then equanimity, which was as much as you could hope for. Can I take it out in public? She'd asked. Drape it over my shoulder, I mean. You know, like you see in ads sometimes, or this one girl I saw in South Beach, I think she was a model, but she had a snake wrapped around her and it was really, I don't know, eye-catching. RJ had shrugged. They can get used to anything. So now, because Todd wasn't here and wasn't answering her calls, and because she was excited and bored in equal measure and maybe a little drunk, she loosened the string at the neck of the bag and ducked her head down to take a peek inside and admire her purchase. The snake was right there coiled up and staring at her, utterly calm and unconcerned. If he was cold, he didn't show it. But then she realized she wouldn't have known one way or another. What was he going to do? Shiver? When she glanced up, Cora was right there in front of her, leaning over the bar to get a better look at what she had in her lap. Herps, don't tell me you got a snake from RJ. She nodded. The couple Speedboat tans, hair dyed the exact same rusted out color as if they'd gone halvesies on a box of nice and easy. <laughs> Swung their heads around too. I've got two balls myself, Mojave mystics, you know mystics. She felt a secret thrill. She had a snake in a bag, not even on display, and already she could feel the power of it. No, I'm sorry, she said. This is like my first. The admission took the power out of her, but it didn't seem to phase Cora. Cora wore a ton of lipstick. Her grin was emphatic. Well, don't be shy. Let's see it. You mean here? Where else? I'm a certified Ophidian lover, and Lois and Larry here love everything. Right, Lo? After the second drink, anyway. <laughs> <coughs> there was a mad spike of laughter that ended with Lois coughing into her fist. Up on the TV, the soccer ball got kicked around. Come on, come on, Cora insisted. Don't keep him to yourself. Let's see it already. The drinks, magnified by her dehydration, were having their effect. But she hadn't reached the point where she could just randomly stick her hand in a bag that contained a live snake. So she said, you sure? 
If it's a baby python, believe me, he's not going to bite you unless you've got a gaboon viper in there. And I know for a fact RJ doesn't handle anything with fangs. She shot a look to the couple. Thank God for small blessings. (laughs) Another jag of laughter. This was fine. This was convivial. This was just what she wanted. She pulled back the flap of the bag and slipped her hand inside, not knowing what to expect. Pythons could bite, after all, though their teeth were for gripping only and canted backwards to ease the swallowing of their pinkies and fuzzies, or whatever it was, or so RJ had told her. What she felt, the snake's body, its living body, was as smooth and frictionless as leather, no different from the snakeskin purse she had at home. This small but mighty accessory has the power to take any look from zero to a hundred in seconds. In the next moment, it was gliding up her wrist and then her forearm, and when she withdrew her hand from the bag, the snake snake came with it as if it were an extension of her own body, its head weaving and driving forward so she had to bring the other hand into play, while Willie kept shifting back and forth, flicking his tongue and weaving and coursing and trying to climb a ladder in the air that only he could see. Whoa, Lewis said, bringing both her feet up off the floor and hooking her heels over the rung of her stool. You're not going to let that thing loose, are you? The jazz, whatever it was, seemed to time its beat to Willie's movements. And she shaped her hand into a funnel, and he went right through it, and into the funnel of her other hand, and then back again. She felt like a juggler, felt connected, transported, as if this is what she trained her whole life to do, and yes, she was going with the flow, literally. Cora said, he's beautiful, love the pattern, but he's not a ball, is he? He's a Burmy, she said and felt the thrill go exponential. From now on, she'd be explaining this and all that went with it to everybody everywhere she went. And talk about a conversation starter. They get really gigantic. You know that RJ explained that, didn't he? She grinned. The bigger the better, she said. The truth was, she couldn't really picture it. This little thing that was no thicker around than a sausage and barely two feet long, growing up to be a replica of the truck tire and the window across the street. But then that was life, wasn't it? Wasn't that the point? She herself had grown up to look enough like her mother, at least enough that everybody was always saying they must be sisters, which might have been flattering to her mother, but was like poison to her, especially when she was a teenager. But here was Willie, who kept stitching the air with the insistent needle of his head, and now he wanted the bar top, and not knowing what else to do, She gave it to him, and in the next minute, he was working his way up Cora's arm, and Cora was saying, yeah, well, he really is a cool snake, absolutely, and I wouldn't want to put a damper on things, but I tell you, I would have gone with a ball myself. After that, Willie had about 60 seconds more of fame and glory, and then Cora handed him back to her, and she slipped his head into the funnel of her palm and fed him back into the bag and ordered another drink, which Cora said was on her. She nursed the drink, playing with her phone, called Todd three times, without success because he wasn't picking up. She was tipping back the dregs, tonguing her way around the shreds of muddled mint, starting to get angry when Todd finally did show up. In the interim, two younger guys in Marlin's caps had come through the door in a quick pulse of light and wordlessly occupied stools at the far end of the bar. Far from hitting on her, they never even gave her a glance, which was the way she wanted it, of course, but it was somehow disappointing, too, especially the way she was feeling. The snake was in the bag. She was no longer the center of attention, and she was drunk at 3.15 on a Saturday afternoon. (laughs) All the excitement she'd felt had drained away, which was depressing, and she'd begun to relive old resentments and bugaboos of one sort or another, maybe even muttering to herself for a minute or two there. But then Todd stepped through the door, and everything changed. She had a surprise for him. And within the hour, they'd be at home setting up the terrarium, which she realized was going to go perfectly with the clay reproduction her best friend Melody had given her when she graduated college, or at least Willie was. He was like a reverse image of the design and the perfect shade, too. Only the painting was static and he wasn't the plastic arts. And what could be more plastic than this? She watched Todd standing there just inside the doorway, trying to get his bearings. She didn't wave, though. She she wasn't angry, not now, not anymore. He slipped off his sunglasses, and the look on his face went from mild annoyance, is this the right place? She did say chorus, didn't she? To an inflection point of relief and recognition. Here she was, foregrounded against the wall of coruscating bottles, Saturday, party in progress, love, and all the trimmings like something out of a movie. He gave a little wave and came across the room to her, leaning in for the quick peck of a public kiss. 
Sorry, Cat, but they just didn't get it right, or not the way I wanted, and I had to... He paused. Is that your second? Yes, she said, which was true if you were counting from two. <laughs> I guess I've got some catching up to do, he said, waving a hand for Cora, who was deep in conversation with the two Marlins fans at the other end of the bar. This is my fiancé, Todd Rivers, she said, when Cora came to take the drink order. And she couldn't help holding up her left hand to show off her ring, a two-carat ideal-cut diamond set in platinum that had belonged to Todd's mother, who was dead, dead now three months, which was why they were living in Florida in a beach house they could never have afforded on their own, even if they lived a thousand years. So what if the beach was ero eroding? At least it was a beach, which was a whole universe apart from the one-bedroom apartment in Sherman Oaks she'd had since college, featuring a panoramic view of Ventura Boulevard and the 50,000 cars that scraped and glinted and honked their by each day. She was sorry Todd's mother was dead. Sorry she was gonna miss the wedding. Sorry for Todd. But to get a chance to live right on the beach with the ocean on one side and an inlet on the other? That made up for all the sorrow she could even begin to conceive of. <laughs> what are you drinking? Todd lifted the empty glass and took a sniff. Don't tell me it's Florida de Canya, please. How many times do I have to? Here he looked at Cora and shook his head. There's only one ron for me, Bacardi, the carta reserva. Do you have any back there? There were four R's in this speech, and he rattled his tongue over each of them, though he didn't speak more than 10 phrases of Spanish. She didn't begrudge him for showing off. He was a Bacardi ambassador. That was how they paid their bills. Before they were through, he'd buy a round for the bar on his ambassador's account and give Cora his business card, like a salesman. But he wasn't a salesman. He was the next rung up and making good money, which made life even better when you got to live rent-free in your own house with only property taxes and utilities to worry about. When Cora drifted down the bar to mix the drinks, yes, she was having another, she took hold of Todd's arm and leaned into him, pressing her forehead to his shoulder and then thumping it twice as if her head were the ax and his body the tree. I like Flor de Cano, okay, so shoot me. His face went dark. You know it's a business thing, don't you? At least in public. The truth was, and this was a secret, even the torturers wouldn't get out of her. Todd didn't even like rum. When she first met him, his drink was vodka and tonic, but that didn't make sense anymore because the Bacardi was free, and at that price, he found he could just as easily drink rum and tonic with a twist. Just teasing, she said, and that was the truth. She was soaring. So happy in that moment, she seemed to be looking down on the room from a great wing-spread height. The couple shrunk down to half their size, and the two guys at the end of the bar all but invisible. The walls dissolved. The ceiling lifted off. The sky gleamed. She could see all the way across the street and down the block to where Willie's mother lay wrapped round the artificial branch in the store window. Don't you want to see what I bought? He tried to hide the look of alarm or annoyance or whatever it was. He was a good actor and a good guy, and he loved her. He did. She'd do that. He knew it as well as she knew anything. Love was a negotiation. She knew that, too. Yeah, sure, he said giving her his big smile, his ambassador's smile, the smile of a Saturday afternoon when all they had ahead of them now was leisure and pleasure and more of the same. Sure, what is it? A snake, she said, letting go of his arm to bring both hands to bear on loosening the string of the bag in her lap. A snake? You gotta be joking. But here was Willie, weaving up her arm and stabbing his head at the ladder only he could see, and Todd said, Jesus, fuck! and pushed back the stool. <laughs> she almost laughed. His face was so comical, all popped out eyes and shrinking mouth. If only he could see himself, she thought. And she felt the power all over again. Put that thing back in the bag, will you? You can't, what are you thinking? It's okay, Cora doesn't mind. She's got two of them herself. Isn't he beautiful? Put it away. <laughs> the walls and ceiling fell back into place and the speedboat couple reinflated as if they were blow up dolls. The thought came to her that Todd was being a jerk. She hadn't complained when he went out and spent a full third of his mother's life insurance payout on his top-of-the-line Tesla, or when, they'd had, when she'd had to tear up her roots and move out here to Sweatlandia or anything else. <laughs> she made her hand into a funnel, and Willie slid into it, and she put him back in the bag. There was a fresh drink sitting on the bar at her elbow. She stared into Todd's eyes, made a mock toast, and drank off half of it before setting the glass back down on the bar. Jesus, he repeated. You amaze me. You really do. A snake? Who buys a snake? Lots of people, actually. Cora does. Ask her. I'm not asking her. I'm asking you. Where are you going to keep the thing? 
Who's going to take care of it, huh? Tell me that. Cora was watching them from the far side of the bar, which was embarrassing. They were fighting in public. And over what? She'd meant to surprise him, and here he was, spoiling everything. I thought next to the TV, actually, where we could watch him when the movie gets boring, like that HBO thing about the race car driver you insisted on watching, because really, come on. She reached for her drink, snatching it off the bar, and if it was about to expl- snatching it off the bar as if it were about to explode, and so what if she spilled a drop or two? So what? And if you want to know, I bought this walnut stand for the terrarium that'll be perfect where your mother's ugly low boy is and why anybody would ever paint over natural wood is beyond me. And I bought bedding for him and fuzzies and all the rest. A snake hook too. And don't you worry, I'm going to take care of him 100%. I mean, I thought you'd be happy. I thought that he'd be for both of us. Right, he said. Like you took care of the house plants? I told you, they were overwatered. Fuzzies, he said. What the fuck are fuzzies? <laughs> Thank you. So that was a lot of fun for us. I hope you enjoyed it. We still have time left. We were going to read you the entire book, but Patsy said, <laughs> Patsy said no, not without pizza. So... Um, We're ready to take any questions you might have. I can tell you a little bit more about the book. You've got the introduction. This is the beginning. Uh, The next chapter, we see the mother, Ottilie, living here in Santa Barbara. She is the kind of person, like many of us in this auditorium, who who are socially conscious and environmentally conscious and want to reduce their carbon footprint. And so in the second chapter, she's giving an elegant dinner party, but serving insect cuisine because... Eating insects is a lot easier on the earth than eating cattle, for instance. Uh, The third chapter takes you to the son, Cooper, who is an entomologist working in the Santa Ynez Valley, um, uh, who is sort of the kind of environmentalist who is a little bit critical of everybody else. (laughs) And then we spin on from there uh, uh, through, through the story. So, questions? Yes. Um, do you, it's a writing question. Do you do a lot of uh, rewriting, like exhaustive rewriting, like some novels do, or does it kind of pour out of you and that's it? I'm, I'm rewriting constantly every day. I need to get into that spell, so I'll read the previous scene or wherever it ended over and over and maybe uh, make little adjustments and hope to get into that state of mind where you're not aware that you're working or that anything else is going on in the world. And sometimes I get there and sometimes I don't. This is why, as many of you will know, I always keep a loaded 357 Magnum on the desk (laughs) as a reminder of what else there is. And if you've got a question, I do have a microphone to pass to you. So raise your hand. Right here. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I've enjoyed the book very much. Um, my husband and I are backyard beekeepers, and there's a whole section. You know, bees are a theme in the in the book. And I was wondering if you are a beekeeper yourself, or how you did the research, because you you really nailed it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I've always dreamed about it, and I have been an accidental beekeeper three times. <laughs> three times. Uh, they moved into the guest house and started to produce honey, which was dripping through the walls and so on. Okay, they're bees, let them do it. But sadly, they died off, I don't know why. And the second time, they died off. But the little joke about fresh garbage honey. So one day, we had, we'd been away, and used the trash can for a while, and I, I saw bees flying out of the little circular hole in the top. And I gingerly opened it, and they had built their honeycombs all around the trash, but there was a little trash in the bottom, but you know, there was. And I said, wow, you know, we can sell this. A lot of people sell clover honey, uh, you know, pure garbage honey. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> but my wife nixed that idea. Others? Yes. Uh, no, everything is hard. It's, it's excruciating. 
it's excruciating. But some of you may know my essay, This Monkey, My Back, in which I relate creating art fiction to a kind of drug addiction. Once you get that tremendous high when it comes together, and again, I don't have any outlines. I don't know what it's going to be. Of course, this is all internal, and it's happening day by day, and I'll jot notes in my terrible handwriting, which I can't read anyway. But uh, it's so exhilarating. It's like shooting up and having this tremendous exhilaration when you see it's right and it comes together. But you've got a Jones, and so you have to do it again and again and again. And this is why, despite my professorship and my PhD, I never wanted to be a man of letters, giving uh, you know, lectures and writing essays, which is fine, but that's not my life. I'm an artist. I want to be an artist, purely and simply, and just address whatever uh, interests me or intrigues me or bothers me. So that I've never written anything thinking, oh, wow, if I write about this, I make a lot of money, or boy, this is what people want to hear about. Sorry, folks, I don't really care about that. All I care about is what I want to do next. And uh, you can see, uh, going back through my books, how the environmental themes have sort of climbed on top of everything else, from my early stories to the tortilla curtain, the subtext of which, of course, is we are animals and we cannot be regulated by borders, and on, on through when the killing's done, as you mentioned, about uh, the removal of the endangered species on uh, Santa Cruz Island. And on to this one, which, as I say, is a kind of reassessment of what a friend of the earth gave us. Yes? Did you say you write those out by hand? No, no. I've never written anything by hand. I always worked on a uh, keyboard. So before computers were invented, I typed on an Underwood Olivetti my mother had given me when I went to college. And by God, my fingers were strong in those days. <laughs> Not so strong anymore. But I switch to the, I hate any kind of technology. I hate switching to anything. I just want already what I have. I'm a terrible consumer. I don't want anything except what I already have. Anyway, um, as soon as I saw that I could make it perfect, that was the end of the typewriter. And it, since I've always composed on a keyboard anyway, it was an easy transition. Yes? <laughs> well, um, I don't know exactly. I have ideas and I jot them down, and they're never long ideas. They're just a few sentences, you know. Uh, man eats his own head and uh, gets married. Um, and then I think about that and what would that be. Uh, since completing this book, I've written six new stories, one of which is in Esquire this week. Uh, it's called Sanctuary. And uh, during the time of writing this book, I wasn't able to address all the crap going down in society. And I'm talking about MAGA. So in this story, it's about the butterfly sanctuary on the Texas border, which the MAGA people uh, are building the wall and trying to close down and so on. Uh, and I got to get that out of my system. And I've written several others. One you saw in the New Yorker, I think, in, in ooh, November. And there's a new one coming in the New Yorker very shortly as well. Uh, in the meanwhile, yes, I am attempting to write another novel. And it's quite beautiful and exciting, but I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> this is a similar question to the lady that asked you if you were ever a beekeeper. Have you ever owned snakes? And if not, or even if, what was your inspiration to use snakes in this story? Okay, as with the answer to the beekeepers in the front road, uh, yeah, I've had snakes, but only accidentally. They live in our yard. Our yard is a sort of uh, open nature place for all the creatures. I, there's a little pond for them to drink out of. Uh, the monarchs come seasonally. And, of course, as you may know, they play a big role in this book, too. Um, I've never had a snake in a terrarium. When I was, my totem animal is the fish. When I was a kid, I loved, loved aquariums and aquatic life of any kind. Uh, but of course, you can't ever go anywhere if you have an aquarium or they will all die. So I graduated from that and I have a pond and the fish get, and the frogs and so on get on, and the dragonflies get on perfectly well without me. What's it 
like having your daughter, hearing your daughter performing your work. I love it. She's a much better actor than I am, too. And um, we did the show here, many of you may have seen, it, which was a call and response. There were, it's called The Shape of a Teardrop that was in The New Yorker a few years ago. And uh, it's about a son of 32 who is this kind of nightmare kid who never left home. He doesn't have a job. He's living in the basement where he put panels up when he was 16. He listens to electronic music all day long. He's, he's rude. He doesn't have a job. And his mother gives the second part. And, and she is uh, loving, but put upon. And so that was a lot of fun for us. She, if those, for those of you who are here, I uh, stood up here and I said, you know, you know, someone else helped me with this story. My mother. And everybody looked and said, Jesus, his mother? How can he have, have a mother at his age? And, and Carrie had on a wig and frumpy clothes and big glasses, and she limped all the way down on the stage. Everybody was staggered. Is that his mother? And finally, at the end, I said, okay, take the wig off. So we have a lot of fun. And again, she's, she's a wonderful actress, a filmmaker, and writer in her own right. So it's exciting. Yes? What makes your blood boil? And is that inspiration for your novel? Yeah, what makes my blood boil is what's making all our blood boil. The uh, attempted fascist takeover of the United States and the destruction of our democracy. Um, I did write the story Sanctuary, but you'll see that it presents both sides. Uh, you know which side I'm on. But um, I think it's, it's difficult to write fiction if you have an ax to grind or an agenda. Your fiction, art in general, is supposed to be a communication between the viewer, the reader, and the artist. And if you're pushing something, uh, it doesn't really work. Uh, I was reminded today of one of my old stories called <laughs> Bulletproof, one of which I am most proud. Uh, you, at the LA Times today, the controversy over uh, textbooks from you know, the right wing yahoos who don't even know how to read. Uh, this happened with George Bush. Uh, science was creeping, uh, religion was creeping into science so that for a while there were stickers put on the front of the biology text that said, creationism is a theory just as evolution is a theory. Come on. And so I wrote a story about it. Look it up. Uh, it's in the big book, the second big book of collected stories, Bulletproof, in which the hardest thing for me was to present the other side. And I think, I, in the end, you can judge for yourselves, I think I finally did because what it's about on both sides of any issue biological like this is the great mystery under which we all live. Who are we? Where are we? What is this all about? Uh, we're animals. We pretend not to be. We kill and eat the other animals. We fight wars. There is, we, ha we create religions, but there is no answer to it all. And so somehow, I think, I hope I was able to find the common ground and address that at the end of the story. Bulletproof. So one or two more. Uh, yeah, we're getting toward the end. Yes. Yes, this lady here, yeah. Well, many of them have been made into movies. Only one really big Hollywood, Hollywood production, that was The Road to Wellville, that Alan Parker directed. Uh, uh, there are always many in the works. However, and my daughter works in this industry, uh, there's a strike going on. So <laughs> nobody is going to do anything for some time to come. But yeah, uh, I think I have so many stories, and a lot of them are strongly plotted also, and it, they, they translate well. And there have been many, many movies, a lot of student films, short films, and so on. And two features, uh, but the one big one was a while back. I wait, I await people to make <laughs> great movies. Oh, by the way, I do not work in the industry at all, and will not. I write the books, that's my life. Yes? You're the movie maker. Water music, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's, owned, it was, it's been owned since it came out. Uh, at first, Monty Python guys had it for years, and nothing happened. Then somebody else had it for a while and nothing happened. And then this German guy bought it and he, for Liebling's film. And this is like at least 10 years ago. And nothing's happening. So again, I don't work in the industry because I can't put my creative energy into something that um, 
is somebody else's project. So final question? Yes? Uh, ridiculously old. Uh, maybe 20 or so. Uh, I say that because the old students I had at USC over the years, many of them knew from birth that they were going to be writers and, and did writing. In my day, I grew up in New York in public schools. We didn't have creative writing as such. Uh, and I loved stories, but I didn't, had no idea that we could write stories. So I went to SUNY Potsdam, the state uh, college for music. I played saxophone. I could play the living hell out of it. I could stand on my head and play it. I could sight transpose. But I didn't have any idea of the feeling or rhythm of what we were supposed to play, which was classical music. So I flunked my audition. But I was there. And so I said, all right, I'll be a history major, because I loved history. Um, then, in the second year, we had a class in the American Short Story, and I discovered Flannery O'Connor. I said, okay, I'm a double major, history and English. Third year, I blundered into a greater writing classroom, and here I am. So this is the value of an undergraduate education. You can find out who you are and what you can do. And uh, I didn't immediately pursue it. I, you know, I had other things to, to deal with uh, in life, uh, like um, the other sex and, uh, and, and drugs and things like that. <laughs> but I did keep my hand in, and finally, when I decided this was it, and I grew up, I matured a bit, I went straight forward, and I've been doing it ever since, every day. So, thank you so much. You are a beautiful audience.